Over the last few years, Hyundai has made no secret that they plan to seriously improve fuel efficiency overall for their brand and dedicate themselves to electrification in various forms, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and full EVs, like this brand new EV right in front of me, the all new Kona Electric. For this model year, Hyundai will have not just one, but two full electric vehicles on sale in America. The Hyundai Ioniq Electric, which is shaped more like a traditional sedan, it's about the size of a Hyundai Elantra, and this all-new Kona Electric as well, which has over 250 miles of range and is shaped like a subcompact crossover. Before we dive right into the Kona Electric, let's address one of the big questions I got this week. At the moment, the Kona Electric is only going to be sold in the states in the U.S. that follow California's emissions rules and, of course, California's ZEV mandate. That means that this will be available to approximately 40% of American car purchasers. It will also be sold in Canada as well. Although we don't know exactly what Hyundai's plans are long-term with the Kona Electric, we expect that this will be sold across the U.S. at some point in time, because this is more than just a compliance EV like we've seen out of manufacturers over the last few years in California, where they take just an existing vehicle that wasn't really intended to have an electric drivetrain, jam something under the hood, and then just call that an electric vehicle. The platform that the Kona rides on had electrification in mind, and Hyundai has really spent a lot of time working on a dedicated electric set of components components that can be used in a variety of different vehicles. That's why this has more than 250 miles of range and it also is the fastest version of the Kona you can buy in America. So this is a no compromises electric vehicle in this category. Up front, the overall design is very similar to the gasoline Kona, although you notice we don't have a grill right there in the traditional sense because there's a lot less cooling required in an electric vehicle. We still have an opening down there at the bottom so that we can operate the air conditioning, the heat pump, etc. One thing worth noting is that this little bumpy pattern right here on the front end actually does collect dust a little bit easier. And it's a little bit more difficult than I had expected to clean. The model that we're driving has LED headlamps. Projector headlamps are standard, but they're not LEDs in the base electric model. And then we have incandescent turn signals up top and then some dedicated LED accent strips up there as well. Other than the unique front bumper, there's very little to distinguish the gasoline Kona from this electric model right here. We have the same basic overall shape. This is definitely a crossover in terms of overall styling, but unlike the gas models, you cannot get all wheel drive in the electric version. In terms of overall size, this is a little bit longer than the Chevy Bolt, but the most noticeable dimensional change between the Chevy and this Hyundai right here is actually the vehicle's width, and you'll really notice that on the inside, this is notably wider than the Bolt, making the front seats and the back seats definitely Definitely more comfortable. Versus the most popular electric vehicle in the world, the Nissan LEAF, the Kona is notably shorter, and we have a little bit less interior room as well. That's because logically the most direct competitor for the Nissan LEAF is actually the Hyundai Ioniq, which is again notably larger than this Kona right here. Now at the moment the Nissan LEAF delivers us more electric range than we find in the Hyundai Ioniq Electric, but we actually expect that to change because next year the rumor mill is telling us to expect a bigger battery pack and more power under the hood of that other Hyundai Electric vehicle. We don't know all the details just yet about that change to the Ionic Electric, but you should expect the Kona to still deliver more range and more horsepower than we find in that Ionic. The Ionic is just going to be a little bit more cargo practical and a little bit larger on the inside. Aside from the lack of tailpipe and the small electric badge on the lift gate right over there, there's not much to differentiate the gasoline from the electric version of the Kona. We still have the same tail lamp arrangement where the brake lights are up here on the top and then the turn signals and backup lights are down here lower on the bumper. That helps mirror what's going on on the front of the vehicle. Be sure and let me know what you think about the overall design down there in the comment section below. I'd especially love to know your thoughts versus the Chevy Bolt and of course the upcoming Kia Soul Electric because those are going to be the two closest competitors to this Kona. Likely because the Kona Electric should be seen as the range topping model in the Kona lineup, this comes standard with Hyundai's latest suite of active safety technologies that you'll see on the side of your screen, including radar adaptive cruise control with pedestrian detection, lane keeping assistance, autonomous braking, etc. Now the base model does not have full speed range radar adaptive cruise control with stop and go capability, but if you work your way all the way on up to the top model, you will get that additional feature as well, and that's the one that we're driving today. Hyundai's engineers could have taken the easy route and just borrowed the electric drivetrain from the Ionic Electric and jammed it under this hood. But they decided to go in a different direction and design an all new electric drivetrain and battery system. So under this hood, we have significantly more power than Hyundai's last electric vehicle, 201 horsepower and 290 pound-feet of torque. It's mated to a significantly larger electric battery pack at 64 kilowatt hours of total capacity giving us an EPA range of 258 miles total. 
Also very different than the Ionic, this is a liquid-cooled battery pack, much like we see in the current Tesla lineup. This battery pack can also be heated. Now, the optional battery heater system is not standard, and it is not necessarily available in all markets around the world, so be sure and check out those details. We are told that at the moment it is not available in the United States, but it is available in Canada. The ability to both actively heat and actively cool the battery pack and the associated electronics modules in the vehicle is one of the big differentiators between this and the Nissan LEAF, which still has a passive cooled battery pack even in its new longer range edition. It's a little too early to guess about overall battery life just yet, but because of the overall design and the care that Hyundai went through in order to actively heat and actively cool the battery, I suspect that the overall battery pack lifetime and overall battery pack degradation figures are going to be significantly better than what we see in the Nissan LEAF. But this is a more expensive vehicle. The Nissan LEAF can get down to effectively about $20,000 in the U.S. This, after federal tax credits, is going to be about $26,500 for the lowest priced model. Charging happens via an onboard 7.4 kilowatt charger, which is faster than what we see in some of the other discount electric vehicles out there, most notably the Nissan LEAF. It happens via this J1772 charging port right here in the front nose of the vehicle. The only battery charge indicator is right over here in this area. We don't have one on the dashboard like we see in some of the competition. The Kona also supports the latest SAE combo fast charge connector, and that is these two pins right here below the J1772 connector, right down there at the bottom of the charging area. Although at this point in time, there are a relatively similar number of SAE combo connectors, which is again this connector right here, and Chatamo connectors in the U.S., I expect that over the next few years, this is going to become the dominant standard in this country. Because at this point in time, the only manufacturers left that still support the older Chatamo standard are Nissan and of course Mitsubishi with their plug-in hybrid. When DC fast charging, it's important to know that not all stations charge at the same rate. Most of the stations in the United States are 50 kilowatt stations, and that's the amount of power you can actually send to the battery at one time. Now, this vehicle will support a maximum charge rate of around 74 kilowatts total if you can connect this to an 80 kilowatt charger or a 100 kilowatt charger. Unfortunately, at this time, those faster charging stations are not very plentiful in the U.S., and at the moment, there is just one that's local to me here in California. We should be seeing more of those 80 kilowatt and faster stations in the United States over the coming few years, but at this moment in time, most of the stations that you'll be able to plug this into will be charging at 50 kilowatts. It'll take about 15 minutes longer or so at 50 kilowatts to get this up to the 80% mark. Hopping into the front seats, I found these overall seat designs pretty comfortable, notably more comfortable than what we find in the Chevy Bolt. Our overall score depends on what you want to compare the Kona to. If you're comparing this to the average subcompact crossover in America, which is a much wider pool, then I'm going to give these front seats 8 out of 10 points. If, however, we're comparing this to electric vehicles in this price range only, something like the Chevy Bolt, the Nissan Leaf, etc., then I'm going to give these seats 9 out of 10 points. The biggest difference between this and the Chevy Bolt in terms of front seat comfort is found right here in the shoulder area because the seat design in the Bolt actually kind of makes it feel like I have to scrunch my shoulders forward in order to fit in that seat comfortably. And we don't see that same sort of thing here in the Kona. These seats are a little bit wider. They're definitely designed for a broader range of body types. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion and a two-way adjustable lumbar support in this trim. Bearing in mind that the Kona is a subcompact crossover, overall legroom back here is definitely below some of the larger EVs that you might find in the U.S. Although sitting right here behind myself at six feet tall, I definitely have that front seat in a comfortable position. I still have about an inch of legroom left. Also, if I sit very upright, even though we are in the model with the moonroof, I have about half an inch to an inch of headroom left. There's enough room here for me to sit in the middle seat and still sit very upright. My hair is just barely brushing the ceiling right there. But you can see that due to the overall size of the Kona, there's just not enough legroom for the front seat to be all the way back in its tracks and an adult male to sit behind. Thanks to the new battery pack design and the liquid cooling system, no cargo space is taken up to deal with battery pack heating or cooling. That means that we still have over 19 cubic feet of storage space back here. Definitely enough room for a lot of luggage compared to a number of subcompact crossovers out there or something like the Chevy Bolt. 
there's less space back here than we find in the Nissan Leaf, but this cargo area is more traditionally shaped. We have a storage divider right there under the load floor, and if we lift that up, we find more additional storage space, along with areas to uh, put your charging cable, the can of fix a flat, etc. But if I lift this completely out of the way, you will notice that we have a spare tire well back here. That's because we have exactly the same body stamping back here that we find in the non electric version of the Kona. So if you wanted to put a spare tire back here, a compact one would fit, but you'd have to buy one aftermarket. The rear seats fold in a 60-40 fashion, level with the cargo area in the back, making it very easy to roll luggage right on inside. Moving to the inside, the model that we're driving has a pretty standard sized moonroof. It goes to just over the driver and front passenger's heads. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts and two-way adjustable headrests. The model that we're driving has the available leather upholstery. The seats are perforated because they're both heated and ventilated. Quite logically, the Kona Electric shares its interior componentry with the gasoline versions of the Kona, so we find the same kind of parts quality and same kind of build quality that we find in that model. Most of the door panels are made from hard plastics, as you'd expect in the mainstream subcompact crossover segment, but we do have a soft armrest right over there, and there are also some soft touch components as we move on over to the dashboard. However, the soft touch materials over here are limited mainly to this small section right here between the bulk of the dashboard panel and then this lower portion of the dash, which are hard plastics on either side. Overall, the interior of the Ionic has a slightly more premium feel, although it's not quite as fresh as the design that we find in this Kona. But that's pretty logical because the Ionic does get a little bit more expensive. In the middle of the dashboard, we have a touchscreen infotainment system mounted on the dash, sort of like a tablet computer. This offers Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration. There are a number of software changes just for this EV trim. So if I hit this EV button over here, you'll see that we have the range circle right there, the ability to change the charge timer, climate control timer in the vehicle, an option to tell you how much CO2 you're saving. We can get our energy information right here, range with and without the climate control, current battery level, and you can see where your energy has been going. Since on this ignition cycle, we've just been filming, so nothing has been taken up by the drivetrain. Everything has been taken up by the climate and the vehicle electronics. You can see battery care over there, heating and cooling the battery has been zero kilowatts. Moving back there, you can also change the way the DC fast charger function behaves, whether we want to charge the battery to 40%, 30%, 100%, etc. You can do that right there in that software right there. Once that option is set, this screen will tell you how long it would take to get to that particular charge level. So going from 85 to 90% on the fastest fast charger available would only take about 16 minutes. If we were plugging this on a 120 volt cord to get to 100%, which is the option right there, it would take nine hours, 50 minutes, but just two hours, 10 on a pretty standard 240 volt cord. This screen is also where we would change the way certain drive mode settings behave. For instance, this is the sport drive mode screen, so we can adjust the way the climate control behaves, the coast energy regeneration level. Uh, we can choose between three different levels right there. If I move over to Eco and hit that settings button there, we have another option, maximum speed limit, so we can actually set that here for additional energy savings, 60, 65, 70, 80, etc. Now, if you want to go over that particular speed limit, you just have to push the throttle all the way down, and then it will let you accelerate above that. Below the infotainment screen, we find two large air vents, the vehicle start stop button and the controls for the single zone automatic climate control system. We can hit the climate button over here to get to the climate control screen in the infotainment software right there. We have a heat button here because of course it does require energy to heat the cabin. We're not using waste energy like we find in a gasoline only vehicle. Below that we have a small storage cubby, uh, which I have accidentally jammed closed there with my cable from my phone. We have just barely enough room to stick some of those larger smartphones in there and just barely close the lid. You'll also find a wireless charging mat and the USB and auxiliary input ports there. We have push buttons for the shifter, drive, neutral, park, reverse, right there like that. Two large cup holders over here, an electric parking brake. And then all the way down here at the bottom, we have the controls for the heated and ventilated seats, the drive mode button, heated steering wheel, auto brake hold, a button to enable and disable the parking sensors. The center console is softly padded and opens to reveal a fairly large storage cubby for an electric vehicle. It's kind of a tricky angle, but you can see that there's also a large storage area right there under that center console, easily able to carry medium sized purses, two liter bottles of soda, that sort of thing. The steering wheel is a round design with aggressive sport grips up top, pretty prominent side spokes right here, and this interesting split bottom spoke that wraps sort of under the airbag cover. On the left side of the steering wheel, we find buttons that relate mainly to the infotainment system, voice command, volume up, down, etc. And then on the right side of the wheel, we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system, and then the buttons that control that multifunction display right there in the instrument cluster. 
On the back of the steering wheel, we have paddles that control the way the regen brakes in this vehicle work. You can choose between four different levels of regen braking, all the way from a coasting mode where there is no regen braking to a very aggressive mode, or we can pull this paddle over here on the left side and actually use the regen brakes to come to a complete stop. The instrument cluster is a partial LCD design. We have some LED elements on each side, so battery level over here, high and low on the right side. The area to the right of the power and charge gauge is used for status icons, for instance, the ready light right there, the uh, light for the headlights. If I turn those off, you'll see that light will go out right there. And then everything else you're seeing is being displayed by an in-dash LCD. The design of this LCD section changes based on the drive mode that we're in, so Eco and Eco Plus look basically the same. I press and hold the button in the center console for Eco Plus, but if I move on over to the normal mode, you'll see that we get an analog look for the speedometer right there, and then the range right there prominently in the middle. If I move over to the sport mode, we get a digital speedometer, and then we get a power gauge 0 to 100% instead. The far right portion of the LCD is used for things like the trip computer readout, turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions, status of the vehicle's active safety systems, and the ability to change certain vehicle settings. So this is how we would adjust the heads-up display, driver assistance features, etc. Those are not adjusted via the infotainment center, but rather via this screen and some buttons on the steering wheel. In our tests, this model went from 0 to 60 in 6.4 seconds with the traction control on, and the best time we were able to get after a lot of back and back and forth testing was 6.2 seconds, 0 to 60, which matches the Chevy Bolt. If I were to stop here on this road, however, with the traction control on, and uh, once we come to a complete stop here and floor it, then you can really tell that the vehicle is doing its best to try and limit that torque, to try and get you 0 to 60 in a way that's not spinning the tires too much. If I turn the traction control off and uh, wait till the roadway is a little bit straighter here, and say I'm going perhaps uh, 20 miles an hour or 25 miles an hour, you can actually get a ton of wheel slip even at those higher speeds like that, because there is just so much instant torque happening from this electric motor. Fans of electric cars out there will tell you that the best thing about an electric car is that instant torque feel, and we definitely get that in the Kona. And this has a ton of torque, 290 pound-feet, is more than we find in a lot of luxury sedans out there, and it's available from very, very low RPMs. One of the big things you'll notice about this electric drivetrain under the hood of the Kona versus basically the same drivetrain under the hood of the new Nero EV is that Kia decided to really dial back that torque an awful lot in the Nero. So it does not have that same tire shredding personality that we find in the Kona. And I find that a little bit of a disappointment in the Kia, to be perfectly honest, because this is just an awful lot more fun. And it's going to go faster 0 to 60 if you can control yourself or if you put wider tires on it. That makes this, quite simply, the fastest mainstream subcompact crossover in America. If you want to go faster 0 to 60 than this, you'll have to buy a luxury or near-luxury vehicle. Something like a BMW X1 or X2 will go faster than this, but something like an Audi Q3 actually won't. Overall brake feel is excellent in the Kona EV. They've really done a great job at feathering the transition from regen braking to friction braking very well. So whether you're panic stopping, uh, transitioning from a standard stop to a panic stop or vice versa, everything is very, very well sorted in this vehicle. And I really like these regen paddles on the back of the steering wheel. The EcoFocus tires on this model aren't just holding back the 0 to 60 time, they're also holding back the overall braking score and of course the handling score just as you'd expect. These are obviously efficiency focused tires and they're the way that this vehicle gets to 258 miles of EV range. But on the downside, it also is probably the reason that it took us 128 feet to go from 60 miles back to zero. That is a little on the long side for this segment, and actually still a little bit on the long side when compared against some of those other electric vehicles out there. Although it is worth noting that the Chevy Bolt actually took a little bit longer than this also like the fact that Hyundai has given us a true coast mode, which is something that we don't find in all of the mainstream electric vehicles out there. Generally speaking, coasting is going to be more efficient than regenerating power back into the battery and then using it again later. So if you are really interested in hypermiling, then this could be more efficient, especially on long highway journeys where you can keep a very long distance between you and the vehicle in front of you and just coast as the traffic changes in its overall speed. 
Of course, if you want more aggressive regen braking, we definitely have that. We have three levels of regen braking. The more aggressive ones will put on the brake lights at the rear. And then, of course, if you wanted to stop, as long as you don't have your foot on the brake pedal, we can just click the paddle down on the left and we'll actually come to a complete stop. The regen braking in that mode is fairly aggressive and it will actually hold you there at that stop. If you want the absolute best handling Kona, that would be the gasoline model with the widest tires available. But the electric version is no slouch either. This actually handles pretty well for an electric car in this mainstream segment. I find the overall driving nature of this much more pleasant than what we find in the Nissan Leaf. Although, again, the Nissan Leaf is really not bad as far as mainstream vehicles go. Overall grip in this model is going to be a little bit below the average subcompact crossover just due to the overall weight of the Kona. Batteries are heavy and that's why the overall curb weight of this vehicle ends up being a lot closer to something like a Hyundai Sonata than something like the Hyundai Elantra. But on the other hand, because the batteries are underneath the vehicle and they're of course in the back of the vehicle as well, the overall weight balance of this ends up feeling a little bit better than the average entry in the segment. It has a more balanced, more neutral feel to it. Again, this is the kind of vehicle where if you were to put summer tires on it, you would definitely have an awful lot of fun. But of course, that would come at the expense of range. Although the electric version of the Kona is available only with front wheel drive, overall ground clearance is a little bit higher than some of the competition at 6.2 inches overall. This is clearly lower than many of those other crossovers out there, but as far as dedicated electric vehicles go, 6.2 is a reasonable amount of clearance. The overall design of the suspension not only gives us a little bit of extra clearance, but also a little bit more cushion than we find in something like the Chevy Bolt. So this is definitely a little bit more comfortable out on a gravel road like this or out on a rougher stretch of highway. Keep in mind that this is still a subcompact vehicle, so the wheelbase is pretty narrow, and that means that we do get a little bit of bobblehead feel over washboard pavement. In our cabin noise tests at 50 miles an hour, we clocked 74 decibels overall in this cabin. That does make this a little bit louder than something like the Nissan Leaf. The big thing with the Nissan Leaf is that we get more wind noise, whereas in this cabin we get more road noise, and the road noise does seem to bump that score up above what we find in the Leaf. On the other hand, overall cabin noise is quite comparable to what we see in the Chevy Bolt. Now we must talk about range and overall efficiency. We've been averaging about 3.8 to 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour, which is pretty good. That definitely is a little bit above the average in this smaller end of the EV segment. And that's why we were able to get the 250 miles of overall range in this vehicle in our testing. Now, 258 miles of range is possible as long as you're not really heating or cooling the cabin and you're not going up over mountain passes like I tend to every day. In our real world testing, we were able to get about 220 to 240 miles of range out of this vehicle, which is very, very similar to what we got in the Nero EV. At this point in time, you're probably thinking, hang on a minute, I haven't seen a Nero EV review on your channel yet. That's because we've driven it but Kia has not announced pricing yet, so I can't comment on how good of a value it is, so we're holding on to the drive sections, etc., until we actually have official pricing information, but I have actually driven it. In terms of overall range, the Kona and the Nero are very, very close to one another because they have the same electric motor, same battery pack, basically the same tire size, etc. But the Kona is going to be a little bit more efficient in highway driving because it's not as wide of a vehicle. Its frontal section is shaped differently as well. So the overall form of the vehicle is more aerodynamic and that's gonna give you that better, longer range. However, depending on your terrain and of course the weather out there, the range could end up being somewhat similar. For our long range test, I scheduled a 225 mile road trip. It was a little over 110 miles in each direction. And on that road trip, we were not quite able to make that complete round trip on one battery. We did have to stop at a DC fast charge station and suck up power for about 10 minutes. About the same time that you'd stop at a gas station and get a few gallons of gas. The main reason that we weren't able to make the trip completely was because it was cold outside. It was about 40 degrees when we started the trip, ended up right around 32, 33 when we ended the trip. Colder weather has a big impact on your overall range, not just because you will see a very, very slight reduction in the overall capacity in colder weather. That is something that has been noted before, but the impact of that is actually very small, but rather because you're using the heater in the cabin because we humans tend to not like 30 degree weather. We like 70 degree weather weather. And heating the cabin from 30 to 70 is actually a much bigger differential and consumes more power 
than say cooling the cabin from a 100 degree ambient temperature down to 70 degrees in the cabin. It simply takes more energy. And that's something that a lot of folks don't realize because in a regular gasoline car, you're using waste energy to heat the cabin. It doesn't cost you anything to heat that cabin in the car. And the overall impact of a few percent on your air conditioning just sort of masks itself an awful lot better in a car when you're only getting 20, 30 miles per gallon. But in a vehicle like this, where the efficiency is much higher and we're just not carrying as much energy on board, heating the cabin consumes an awful lot more. For 2019, the Kona EV starts at $36,450 for the base SEL trim. The important thing to remember with electric vehicles right now is that there are two electric vehicle manufacturers whose tax credits are running out, Tesla and General Motors. Tesla is obviously not a direct competitor to the Hyundai, however, General Motors with their Chevy Bolt is, and the Bolt's tax credit starts getting cut in half April 1st of 2019. After that point, you're going to notice that the Kona is going to get considerably less expensive than that Chevy model. As we see in most mainstream vehicles, if you want some of the fancier features that we were driving this week, you will have to work your way on up the trim ladder. We were driving the Ultimate trim, which came in at $44,650. If you want the basics like LED headlamps, however, you'll get those in the mid-level limited trim. Something worth noting that you won't find on this list of features is the available heat pump system and battery heating system that we do find in other markets around the world, most notably our neighbors up in Canada. Heating the cabin with a heat pump is considerably more efficient than heating the cabin with a resistive element heater like we find in American market destined Kona models or the Chevy Bolt. That's likely why when we drove the Kona for a longer drive session, over 200 miles, we didn't get quite the EPA range out of it. It's also likely why the related Kia EV, the Nero EV, actually came pretty close in terms of overall EPA range because the Kia EVs for some reason will get the heat pump in the United States. The Kona and the Chevy Bolt, the competitor from Chevy, will not get a heat pump in this country. With that out of the way, let's dive right into the competition. The first and most important thing to keep in mind, of course, is that the Tesla is not a direct competitor to this, as much as many people might try and make it one. A BMW 3 Series is not a Hyundai Kona competitor, so logically, something that competes with the BMW 3 Series should not be a Hyundai Kona competitor either, regardless of how it is powered. It's also worth noting that the Kona belongs to a newer segment of electric vehicles in America, a mainstream segment where we're getting real-world kind of range out of the battery packs. And that also excludes entries like the Volkswagen e-Golf, which has a much shorter range overall, as well as the Hyundai Ioniq, the other electric vehicle in Hyundai's lineup. I'd be remiss if our first competitor wasn't the Nissan Leaf, however, despite its 150 mile range. The main reason for that is that the Leaf is the best selling electric car in the world, and it is the only electric car that you can get easily in all 50 states, because you can't actually even get Teslas easily in all 50 states in the US right now. With a 150 mile range for $30,000, the Nissan Leaf is also easily the least expensive entry in this segment. After you factored in all the available tax credits, you could end up right around $19,990 before destination. Of course, the model that's truly going to compete with the Kona is the new Leaf Plus model. That will get you between 226 miles or 215 miles of overall EV range. Now, we don't know exactly how much that model is going to cost, but Nissan has promised that it's going to be less expensive than the Kona. That actually makes sense because the battery pack is a little bit smaller than what we find in the Kona. The overall range is a little bit shorter as well. And there are a few features missing in that base model that we do find in the Kona. Instead of adaptive radar cruise control, we get simply a collision warning and mitigation system. There's also a notably slower onboard charger. And that means that if you plug it into a 220 volt outlet, you're not going to gain range as quickly as you will see in the Hyundai. On the flip side, Nissan does offer a heat pump system, which is going to be more efficient if you live in a colder climate. Of course, the flip side to that is that the overall battery pack is not temperature managed quite the same way as what we see in the Hyundai. The Hyundai system uses an active liquid cooled battery pack, which is going to help you in higher temperatures, especially if you're driving around in some place like Tucson, Arizona or Phoenix, Arizona, where temperatures can get really high. Or if you're planning on doing a longer road trip where you're going to be doing an awful lot of DC fast charging back to back to back, the Hyundai Kona is going to be better able to handle that because its battery pack is active cooled, not passive cooled like we find in all versions of the Leaf. 
The most obvious direct competitors to the Kona EV are the related EVs from sister brand Kia. We have the recently launched Nero EV, which is a little bit larger than the Kona, and the upcoming Soul EV, which is going to be right about the same size and is actually very, very closely related as well. The important thing to remember when comparing against the Kia models is that the motor and the battery are shared between all three vehicles, but the structure of the vehicle is not necessarily shared. The biggest difference is with the Nero, which is a larger vehicle overall. It's most noticeable in the width. Now, because of the way that the vehicle is packaged, you don't necessarily get that much more room on the inside of the Nero, but the outside of the Nero is definitely a little bit larger. The sole is a lot closer in terms of overall dimensions to the Kona, and I think it actually ends up being a little bit more space efficient overall. But the way that Hyundai and Kia have chosen to option up the vehicles is definitely different. So if you want some of the luxury features that we found in the model that we were driving, like the ventilated seats, you won't find those on the Soul EV, but you will find them on the Nero EV. When it comes to overall range, the Nero is the lowest set of these triplets because of its overall larger frontal area, the fact that it is a little bit bigger in terms of the overall size. The Soul comes somewhere in the middle, and the Kona is the most efficient and gives us the longest range. But as I said before, the Kona cannot get a heat pump system, and for some reason Kia is going to be offering that system in both the Nero and the Soul EV for 2019. It's not going to be standard, you will have to select that option box, but you can get it in even the base trims of those particular models. So if you live in a colder area, so for instance if you're buying your Nero EV or your Soul EV in the Washington state or in New York state, then you may be interested in that particular option. We're told also to expect the Nero EV and likely the Soul EV to be sold in more states than just California. Kia has not been specific about the Soul sales plans, but they have said that the Nero will be available in states like Georgia and Texas, which are not part of the California Zero Emissions Program. On the downside, we don't know the exact pricing of either of the Kia models. Even though we've driven the Nero several times, Kia has not actually announced official pricing yet. They have, however, said to expect it to be very, very similar to the Kona, which is reasonable since it is very closely related. And the other thing to keep in mind is that for some reason, Kia has decided to really tone down the electric drivetrain versus what we see in the Hyundai. In the Hyundai, if you turn off stability and traction control, you can just roast the front tires for a good 150, 200 feet. You can do some epic EV burnouts in a very compact little crossover. But for some reason, you can't do that in the related Kia products. They've decided to really dial things back, make it a lot more civilized, but as a result, a little bit less fun as well. Speaking of tire roasting, our next competitor is the Chevy Bolt, which will do a good job of roasting its tires all by itself. This model also does not have a heat pump heating system. That's one of the design choices that GM made in order to help keep prices relatively low. That was important because the Bolt has now suddenly lost its EV tax credit starting April 1st. For the first few months, it will be cut in half, and then after that, it's going to get cut in half again before sunsetting entirely after about 12 months or so. That means that the longer you wait after watching this video to do your electric vehicle shopping, the larger the delta will be between the Hyundai and the Chevy electric vehicle. Likely because of the overall narrow profile of the Bolt, the driver and front passenger seats are narrow as well, and they have a definite pronounced shoulder to them. So I found myself kind of sitting like this in the seat, really with my shoulders pressed in a little bit. It wasn't the most comfortable driver's seat in this particular segment and the seats in the Kona are definitely more comfortable. But on the flip side, the Bolt does well when it comes to overall EV efficiency, as well as range gaining, because it does have an onboard 7.2 kilowatt charger, just a hair slower than what we find in the Hyundai. At this point in time, that's the extent of the direct competition for the Kona, the Nero, the Soul EV, or really the Chevy Bolt as well. If you want to stretch things a little bit, you could toss the Leaf in this particular category, but there are no other mainstream EVs that are under $40,000 that have this kind of range overall to them. As far as my top pick in this particular segment, I have to say, that I am actually pretty torn. Assuming that the Nero EV and the Soul EV end up right around the same price as the Kona EV, I'd have a really tough time picking between the three of them. I like aspects of all of these three options, and I would rate them above the Nissan Leaf and above the Chevy Bolt as well. But exactly which one of them I would pick, I don't know. And that actually is kind of a pressing question because my lease on my own Soul EV is actually coming up in June, and I have to make that decision pretty quickly myself. I suspect at the moment, if I had to make this decision, I would get the Kona EV because of its availability. You can actually get it right now in the state of California. And the fact that we can get some of those nicer features in that model that we can't in the Soul EV, like the ventilated seats. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. If you haven't already done so, hit the subscribe button so you can be updated on all of our latest videos, including the car that I end up with 
come June 2019. In the meantime, if you want to support this channel, click up there to the top of your screen. You'll be taken over to patreon.com where you can make a monthly pledge. I'll see you next week.